Welcome back class. I'm Professor G. One of the most one of the more interesting questions in history, uh, especially concerning how we do history or how we're going to study history, is whose perspective should we approach history from? Right? History is a big big topic. So how are we going to tell our story? Are we going to tell our story from the perspective of kings and queens? Are we going to tell our story from the perspective of common people? Are we going to tell our story from the perspective of the West, from Europe's perspective, from the Native Americans' perspective, from the Africans' perspective? How are we going to go about doing this? Now, I raise this question because it ties into one of the more, probably the most interesting question of modern history. And since this is world history too, we're going to be primarily concerned with uh, what historians call modern history, from about the 15th century to the present, to the 21st century. So one of the central questions of modern history is, why Europe? Okay, so look at your world today. Look at the countries that are on top. Look at the countries that are making the most money. They are predominantly white European countries with the exception of America, of course, but America is the exception. So why is this? Have you ever thought about that? Why are the first world countries today the first world countries? Why isn't, for example, China the uh, 21st century version of America? Why isn't the Indian economy doing better? Why are almost all of the African nations in poverty? And this is a question that can be addressed from a historical perspective. And in my World History II class, I look at history primarily from the European perspective. And this is due principally to the fact that Europe presents the biggest puzzle of modern history. Why is it the case that these small, tiny European countries were able to, within a span of about 300 years, that they were able to conquer the globe. There's nothing particularly special about Europe in the 15th century. Uh, it's not like they were powerful. It's not like they were more wealthy than everybody else. It's not like they were smarter than everybody else. It's not like they had better technology or anything like that. But somehow, in a relatively short period of time, they're able to subdue the entire globe to split the world between themselves, to exploit indigenous people. So how did this happen? I won't be able to answer that question probably to your satisfaction, but I think there are some good reasons for why it happened. All right. So 15th century Europe is a very fragmented place. Uh, the European nations are constantly at war. Uh, Europe isn't uh, economically stable. There, there's constant infighting. There's constant bid for powers. Um, and so there, there's several reasons. So it's interesting that this sort of backwater place would come to dominate the globe by the 19th century. So let's look at the historical causes why. First of all is competition competition. So I said that you have all these small nations uh, bidding for power, struggling against each other for control over small tracts of land. Now when I say the word nations, I'm probably giving a false impression. It's not like nations today, like the United States or Britain or France. It's more like large families competing for agricultural resources. Europe at this time, their economy is predominantly um, agriculture based. It's the feudal system. You have a king, a queen, a lord over a group of peasants who are working the land, and this is the primary income for that king or queen. And so these, these small European nations are biding for power. If you want to look up a map of the world real quick, this would probably be very helpful. Uh, as I'm talking, you can kind of follow along there. So people are, are struggling for control over a very limited amount of land in Europe. These, these, these families are constantly looking for new means of income. And for some of these families, their options are very limited. Consider, for example, uh, Portugal, and the Portuguese people. They're on the Iberian Peninsula with Spain. 
uh, it's not like they can battle against Spain, it's not like they can take land from Spain. So they're limited in their options. So what Portugal does and what Spain does and what the other nations start to follow suit is they start to look for other means. Now one of the biggest trade routes during this time is the Silk Road. The Silk Road is an ancient trade route that went all the way from modern day China, all the way through the Middle East, up to Turkey, into Europe. Um, the primary goods that were being traded um, were spices from India, silk from China, and also opium from China. And this was a very lucrative, lucrative trade route. Now there's some problems though. Uh, the Europeans at one point in time had control of this trade route uh, predominantly throughout the Middle East but beginning in the 7th century you have the rise of Islam and the rise of Islamic states and by the 15th century the Middle East is controlled predominantly by the Ottoman Empire and with control of the Middle East the Ottomans have control of the Silk Road the Ottomans have control of the flow of goods into Europe so the Ottomans can set the price the Ottomans are trading with the Europeans uh, but they're also at war with the Europeans a lot of times and it's not like they're on good standings with the Europeans so while there is some trading going on it's usually not to the Europeans benefit so they start looking for other means and small states like Portugal who are on the end of the Iberian Peninsula with nowhere to go in mainland Europe they turn to the sea so they turn to two things um, naval exploration and colonization now Europe had known about Africa since Roman times the Romans uh, as you may or may not know have had inhabited northern Africa but the Romans didn't really extend past the Saharan desert into sub-Saharan Africa if you could see your map the Romans inhabited northern Africa along the Mediterranean um, but they didn't really venture down into sub-Saharan Africa so the Europeans knew a little bit about Africa, but when the Portuguese started uh, exploring the coast of Africa, they were really the first to do this. And it's the Portuguese that are able to explore, first explore the coast of Africa. Uh, it's Bartholomew Diaz who reaches the Cape of Good Hope, the southern tip of Africa. And it's Vasco da Gama who finally reaches the Indian Ocean, sailing into the Indian port of Calcutta in the 16th century. Once the Europeans realize that they're able to sell around Africa, they realize that, they've able, that they are now able to establish uh, trading routes overseas uh, to India and to China, and thereby opening up the Indian and the Chinese market, thereby opening up the goods that were previously only available through the Silk Road. So now we have the influx of spices, of silk, and likewise the Chinese are wanting European silver, they're wanting European goods and so the influx of trade and the Portuguese are going to become very very wealthy off of this. But the Spanish also want their piece of the pie. So the Spanish are going to undertake a similar project. Now I'm sure you're very familiar with Columbus and this is exactly what Columbus was trying to do. But of course as you know uh, Columbus didn't reach India by selling west. Instead he reached North America, specifically he landed in the Caribbean, in the Baham modern day Bahamas, right? So you have searching for trade routes, we find a new continent, a new place that is inhabited by a very different group of people, the Native Americans. The first cultures that Columbus encounters are the Central and South American civilizations of the Mayans, the Aztecs, and the Incas who were well advanced in their own ways, right? The, Mount, the Mayan calendar is one of the most advanced uh, astronomical calendars in the world. Still is, even to, the, even to this day. It's, 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 it's a, an amazing piece, it's an amazing piece of astronomy, right? Of course, for them it wasn't astronomy, it was religion. But we'll sidestep that issue for a bit. So you have the opening up of the new world. Now the New World, remember that the, the Spanish and the Portuguese, they're out to make money. Right? All the European nations at this point are out to make money. So one of the things that sets the Europeans apart in this regard is this sense of competition. But what also sets them apart 
is what allows them to get there in the first place and that's the beginning in the 15th and the 16th century the development of European science and we'll talk a lot about the scientific revolution of this course uh, but the scientific revolution is something that is unique to Europe and that is based within this 15th 16th century European context also what you have that sets the Europeans apart and this is this may sound kind of uh, uncontroversial to you because you're so used to it, but is this notion of property rights. So you have European political philosophers such as Thomas Hobbes and such as John Locke who are arguing that it is the responsibility of the state to protect their citizens' property. That if I'm going to go out and if I'm going to explore for Europe, if I'm going to go explore for Spain and for Portugal, and that whatever I find is mine, and that this property is protected by the state, and that the state will issue me land, and that this land will be protected by law. Right, this is something that's unique to Europeans. Also, uh, kind of piggybacking off of the development of the scientific revolution, of course the scientific revolution affects uh, all areas of the natural sciences. Typically we think of Copernicus and Galileo who we'll talk about, but what also happens is significant advancements in modern medicine that allows these Europeans to make these long trips, that allows them to um, figure out solutions to these new diseases that they're encountering, for example, when they tr uh, travel to the tropics and they encounter things such as malaria and they get things like dysentery and Lyme disease and all this other good stuff, right? What this, what's driving this though, so the reason why people are risking their lives in the uh, fifth factor, I guess, if I'm not sure if I was keeping exact count, but the fifth factor, what's driving all of this is the European consumer society. So the only reason, now we, we tend to get this misconception, right, with this sort of romantic picture of history that these people are setting sail to explore the world, to find new lands, right? This, this romantic idea of exploration, of discovering new things. People were doing this to get rich. Right? Let's not sugarcoat this or romanticize it any more than it has to be. People were doing this to get rich. What's driving the European market is this European consumerism, this demand for goods, this willingness to pay high prices for these luxury items. Right? It's not like people need silk. Right? You don't need that to live, but people want it. Right? It's a luxury. It makes them feel good. It makes them feel important. It makes them, it's a status symbol in society. Right? You don't need spices. You can eat food without spices. But spices make food really, really enjoyable. Right? And so people want this, and they're willing to pay money for it. And so this begins the consumer society, right? Something that you all are very used to. Okay, and this is, what, this is the driving force behind this exploration. And we also have this budding notion of the uh, so-called Protestant work ethic. And we'll talk about the Protestant Reformation in the next lecture. So all of these social and cultural factors combined, right? This, this inward bickering and fighting amongst these small European nations of the 15th century leads some of these nations to search for new avenues of revenue, new ways to make money, right? They know a lot of money is being made off of the Silk Road, off of the trade with India and China, and they want a piece of the pie. But they're very limited in their options. Okay, so the Portuguese and the Spanish turn to the sea. They turn to colonization okay, to find new ways to tap into that Indian and Chinese market. The Portuguese are the first to do this by sailing around the southern tip of Africa. But it's not like they're just sailing for the sake of selling. Right? They, they want to make money. This is why they're doing this. And along the way, they're going to establish various forts and outposts and eventually what's going to spring from this is European colonization. Now the Spanish and the Portuguese weren't really into colonization. When we think of colonization we typically think of the American colonies, right? But that was more of a British thing. Um, the Spanish and the Portuguese, the Spanish had their own system of colonization where they would come in and set up a fort and a church in a small town. Um, English colonization was a bit different, but 
as you may or may not know, the Spanish and the Portuguese are going to divide up South America, but Spanish and Portuguese power is going to start to wane by the 17th and 18th century, and Europe's going to become the major naval power, the major colonizer. And it's the European colonies um, that are going to become play an increasingly predominant role in world history, especially the European colony, especially the British colony, sorry, the British colony of North America. And again, this gets back to the economic situation, okay? Why is the American colony doing better now, right? Why is America, a former British colony, more economically stable than, let's say, India? And the answer to that is that the sooner a colony gets rid of its colonial inhabitants, its colonial rulers, the sooner a colony does that, the better off it becomes. And America is one of the first colonies to do that. Okay. So again, one of the central questions that we are going to be focusing on, kind of the model for this course, is why Europe? What makes Europe so special? So for the next week, we're going to talk about the scientific revolution, the Enlightenment. right? So I say all this to justify my Eurocentrism why we're not going to be spending that much time talking about China or talking about Africa. And the reason why is because it is Europe, for good or for ill, most of the time for ill, that is going to shape modern history. Okay, hope this lecture helped. If you have any questions about it, feel free to contact me.